In this video, you will learn how to set up a board properly to begin playing. You will also learn the basics of the language of chess, called chess notation. Without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Now that you have learned how each piece moves, it's time to learn how to set up the board properly to begin a game. We are going to start with the king, which goes on the last row of, of the board, in the middle of the board, on these two squares. It's important to note that each side is a mirror image of each other, so if you ever get confused, you can often refer to the other side to make sure you're setting up the board correctly. To make this as easy as possible, we are going to set up the starting position moving inside out, so from the center towards the outside of the board. The queen belongs directly next to the king. A good way to remember the positions of the king and the queen is that the queen belongs on its own color. So what that means is the white queen starts on the white square, whereas the black queen starts on the dark square. Next to the king and queen are the bishops. Each player gets two of them to start the game. And as each piece is popping on the board, for good practice, you should be thinking to yourself how each piece moves. Outside of the bishops, we have the knights. Both sides also start with two each. And finally, we have the rooks on the outside of the knights, one on each corner of the board. A good way to remember which side of the board the white pieces should begin on, is that this square in the bottom left-hand corner should be a dark square. To complete the setup for a beginning of a chess game, each side gets eight pawns to begin. It's time to learn two important vocabulary words associated with chess. Whenever we refer to vertical channels like this, for example. These are called files in chess. And when we refer to horizontal rows, like this, for instance, these are called ranks. And the reason why ranks and files are so important, not only will we learn about how to utilize them in chess, but as far as communicating with the chess language, it's very important to be able to be familiar with what each of these ranks and files are. So this is the starting position of a chess game. Since you know how each piece moves, the last piece of information is that white always goes first and now you're ready to start playing. Once you're ready to start playing, it's important to learn how to communicate in chess language. When you record games, when you read about games, when you talk about games, and in particular the moves within them, there is a certain chess language that is used to describe where pieces are moved. If you'll notice, on a chessboard, we have some letters and numbers on the board. These letters and numbers that comprise the ranks and files of the chessboard make up a grid system, like a coordinate system, that help you refer to certain squares and moves on the board. So for example, how do we describe what square is which? Take a look at this square right here. This square is known as the E4 square. How do we get there? Well, we always take the letter of the file that it is on, along with the numbered rank the square is on, and just see where they intersect. Okay? So following with our eyes, we will see that right here, that square lands on the E file, and over here with where the numbers are, we will see that that lands on the fourth rank, and they intersect at the E 
four square, okay? So this is described as E4. Similarly, if we were to look at a square like this, for example, quiz yourself briefly to see how would you describe what this square is called. The answer is C5, okay? So we're just following the letter of the file plus the number of the rank. Okay, so now that you know how to communicate the squares, how do we communicate how pieces move to those squares and how things capture? You'll notice in this white part of the screen on the top right, a bunch of letters and numbers combined. And this is what modern day chess language called chess notation looks like. This is how we're able to record games, to describe moves, to share games, to teach people set plans in chess. It's very important to learn this when you're first starting. Okay, so it's easier to see this visually than just hear me talk about it. So notice that when this pawn moves to this square, which we just described, it is recorded as highlighted right here as E4. Okay, so the way chess notation is going to work is whenever you move a piece to a square or capture something, the order is going to be pretty much the same every time. You're going to lead with the abbreviation, the first letter of the piece that moves, and then just the square it moves to. The only exception with this is with pawns. You don't need the capital P in front of the square it moves to. So in this case, E4 just means pawn to E4. Okay, so similarly, E5, what black plays in this situation, just describes the pawn moving to E5. So looking over here ahead to the next move, NF3, what do you think that move means? The answer is knight to f3. So how do we get there? Well, we have the first letter of the piece that we're describing. It's important to note that both king and knight obviously start with the same letter of k. And in this case, the king takes precedence. So the knight starts with an n in chess notation. So that could be a little confusing, but you'll get the hang of it. So NF3 literally just means that the knight moved to F3. And how do we get F3? Once again, we're just merely matching up the coordinate and the intersection point of where that piece lands. And that's really it, guys. It just takes a little bit of practice, uh, some fluidity to get the hang of how to describe piece movement, but that's all you need to know. So NC6 just means knight to C6. This third move here, bc4, you can imagine that b stands for bishop to the c4 square, and you'd be absolutely correct. So it's really not that complicated. be7, d4, just means a pawn moving to the d4 square. All right, and then this weird looking move right here, which we will cover in subsequent videos, is the move called castling, which is the only move in chess where two pieces can move at the exact same time. And again, we will get into that later on. But this is how you describe it. It's just 0-0. Zero zero. NF6, NC3, black castles. Bishop to g5, bishop to g4. Okay, so what happens when another piece takes another piece, or in this case, a pawn takes a pawn? Well, the notation is going to remain the exact same, with the exception that the symbol for capture in chess is an X, or for those of you who are more math inclined, like a multiplication symbol. Okay, so with this move, pawn takes pawn, the way to properly notate this is dxe5. It's fairly simple, right? It describes it by moving d, x means capture, to the e5 square. You know it's a pawn move because there's no uh, letter abbreviation in front of it, right? There's no n, there's no b, there's no r, there's no q, there's no k. 
Uh, it's just D, which describes a pawn in this case. So D, X, E, 5. And same thing if black takes back with the pawn. If black takes back with the knight, however, notice the one little change. The only thing that changes is that the N, the abbreviation for knight, takes the place of the D. But the remainder is still the same. NXE5 literally simply means knight takes E5. Not too complicated. Okay? Last two things to learn is what happens when there's a situation where two of the same piece can take something on a single square. All right. So in this case, you'll notice that white has three possible pieces that can recapture this queen on d1, right? So of course, if a rook simply captures it, that's just rook takes d1. Versus if a knight takes it, it's just going to be knight takes d1, nx d1, right? But the problem is you have two rooks, both of which can take this queen. So how do you properly describe which rook captures the queen? The only change we are going to make here is that after the letter R, we are going to have to describe which rook it is. And the way we do this is we list which file the rook comes from based on its square, right? So this right here is the F rook because it's on F1. And this right here is the A rook because it's on A1, right? So depending on which rook recaptures, we just describe it as follows, highlighted in black right here. RF XD1. All it means is the F rook takes d1. Similarly, if the a work were to capture, it would be r a x d1. Last piece of information for basic notation is that when you check your opponent, and a check in chess just means that you're threatening and attacking the opposing king, that action is denoted by a check, or in this case, a plus symbol. Again, for those of you more math inclined, like addition. Okay? So, for example, if white were to capture this pawn on f7, bxf7, right? This puts the opposing king in check because now that king is threatened to be captured by the white bishop, right? And the only difference here is that at the end of the move, we put that little plus mark, which means check. All right, so in this video, you have learned how to set up a chessboard properly to begin playing the game, as well as the basics and fundamentals of the chess language, chess notation, and how to communicate the moves on a chessboard as you are playing or learning the game.